Good morning, Terry. Good morning. But I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord. Our sick list. Sister Dorothy Duncan, Sister Rachel Young, Mother Mary Brown Franklin, Sister Deetra Thomas, Brother Dorchester Jenkins, Sister Alice Faye Hilton, Sister Lawanda Harris, Deacon Willie Kusick, Sister Rosie Askew, Sister Goldie Mitchell, Mrs. Tamika Hearn, Brother David Yarborough, Sister Jamie Sickles, Brother Henry Smith, Brother Benny Hilton, Sister Donna Youngblood, Sister Grace, Miss Patricia Hurd, Brother Herman Walker, Mr. Carl Smith, Miss Betty Hearns Johnson, and Mr. Benjamin Tolk. Amen.
the next preaching voice room that you will hear will be that of Preston Thornton. Amen. 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 Amen.
so excited to hear y'all. Uh, everybody's come out today. I'm just so thankful to be here. I got my family here. My sister drove all the way up here from Indianapolis. My father-in-law is here. My best friend is here. Oh my God, my, my niece is here. My niece is here. Oh my God, I don't even see you all up here. Lord, it's so good. Yeah, it's so good. I am so thankful. I'm so thankful to uh, Reverend Lee for the opportunity. Thank you. I do not take it lightly. Whenever someone invites you to stand in front of the people of God, it is something to take seriously, and I take it extremely seriously. And Pastor Lee, I just want to thank you for your friendship and your mentorship over my life. I'm so thankful that God told me to allow our path to cross. I don't exactly know what God is up to. Don't really make sense to me. But I trust him and I trust you as my pastor. And I'm following you and I'm praying that God just unleashes a whole other thing that I'm glad to see. Bless y'all. Thanks to everybody who's watching online this morning. I'm so thankful we got folks all across the country checking us out. And I just want to give a special shout out to Sister Evelyn Dalton in the back. Now, Sister Dalton has been prophesying over me for months and months now. Every time she sees me, she says, hey, preacher. I ain't preacher. And I'm like, she know I'm just the guy to run the camera, right? I'm not a preacher. But you know, sometimes God blesses people, gives people with the ability to see something in you that you can't see inside of yourself. Sister Dalton has that gift. And Sister Dalton, we are just thankful for your spirit that's here every week, testifying to the presence of the Holy Ghost and affirming the Word of God. So thank you for your faith. You're a living witness. So guess what I'm going to try to do today? I'm going to try to make it plain and preach. We're going to make it plain today. Thank God for everybody. There is a word from the Lord. Those of you who have your Bibles or your devices with your Bible app on it, this will be the time to pull it up. And I'm going to ask everyone to stand for the word of God. It's going to be a short scripture today. It's coming from 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1, oh, verses 6 through 7. 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 through 7. Y'all got to say amen. You don't got to say hold up. All right. All right, the word of God says, Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the land on of my hand. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, but of love, and of a sound mind. So I want to encourage you this morning to have faith over fear. Faith over fear. Y'all may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, God, for this beautiful day. We thank you for 30 years of ministry in the city of Gary, Indiana, here at Gethsemane, Lord. Father, we thank you for every soul that's gathered here, Lord. Right now, we ask that you enter this place. Father, I ask that you fill me with your Holy Spirit and let everything that I say be directly from you. And I ask, God, that you open every mind and every heart so that they hear your word, so that your will be done. These things I ask in your son, Jesus, Jesus. name. Amen. 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 Faith over fear. So y'all, over the last 18 months, we've been through quite an ordeal as a people. Not only as people in America, but as people around this world. This pandemic is something that we never even envisioned that we'd see. You know, over 600,000 people in America have died. That's, that's like the whole population of the city of Detroit, Michigan. So imagine if Detroit, Michigan just vanished. Over 4 million people worldwide have died. Now we've seen the economy suffer as a result. Millions of people just found themselves out of work, suddenly looking for a job, or unable to pay their rent. People were standing in food lines for the first time ever in their life. All these things added to the stress of the world. It's already stressful just to be just to be alive. Now, outside of current events, I think we all can agree that there's there's enough in this world just to to be fearful about, right? To have to have fear about. 
you know, we have, uh, you know, all kind of things happen in our life that cause us to have fear. It might be that you are worried about your health or worried about your finances or worried about your family. There's all kind of reasons to have fear. You know, you may be asking yourself, like, you know, suppose this virus thing really takes off again, am I safe? You know, well, what about my job? You know, what are, what, you know, what happened to the economy again? Or, or maybe you're dealing with this more real life situation, right? Like, hey, maybe you're trying to figure out how I'm gonna get out of debt. You know, will I find a job that, that I can be successful with? Maybe it's more relationship issues, right? Will I find a mate? Is the person that I'm with the right person to be with? Maybe you are married and you wonder, like, is this marriage even going to last? Now, young people, you not, you know, it's all the fears, too. You might be worried about your grades or worried about I get into college or could I even afford college or what am I going to be when I grow up? Now, are mature saints, so you're not, you know, excluded from fears as well. You, you know, you're getting older and we're getting older and every day there's a different ache or pain and you might be, in some days it's a struggle just to get out of bed. So you might be wondering, like, what's, what's next for me? Right? Am I going to be able to retire comfortably? What about my children and my grandchildren? There's all kinds of things to be fearful of. Now, as I ponder my own fears, because I have fears too, I find myself seeking a word from the Lord on what to do, what does he have to say about fear? And what I found in the word of God over and over again is that God gives us a commandment to fear not. Fear not. He actually gives this commandment to us 365 times in the Bible. 365 times to fear not. Now I didn't go count all of them. Google, Google was amazing. You can Google some stuff and find that. But check it out. 365 times the Lord says to fear not. So what are some examples of when God said to fear not? I'll give you a few. In Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10, God said, fear not, for I am with you. Be not the same, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. John 12, 15 says, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's coat. Isaiah 43, 5 says, Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. Well, Notice a common thing here. Whenever God gives us a commandment to fear not, it's usually right before he's about to do something. Right. Right. He's about to send us into something that's his promise. And he says, fear not. Right, so this should encourage us. Whenever we're facing fear, we should feel like God is about to move. He's about to move. Right? So what does God really mean when he says fear not? What does he mean? So I went to Webster's Dictionary and I looked up the definition of fear. Now, Webster gives three distinct definitions of fear. Now we're going to go each, each one of these very details. I want you to remember the first one the first definition of fear is an unpleasant, strong emotion caused by the awareness of danger. Right? An emotional response because we know danger is, is near. Right? The second definition is a profound reverence and awe, especially towards God. I was surprised to see that in Webster Dictionary. All right, all this reverence toward God is, is one definition of fear. The third one is an attitude of worry. An attitude of worry. Another way to say that is an attitude of anxious concern. All right, so these are three definitions. So we're going to figure out which one of these three definitions is God really talking about when he tells us to fear not. All right, so you guys can think about it. But there's three, di three different definitions. One is emotional response to danger. Two is reference to God. And three is worry. All right? You probably, probably guessed the, the one that God tells us not to do, but we're going to go ahead. So the, uh, let's talk about that first, an emotional response to danger. God gives us an instinctive awareness of danger. We actually give this to all of the things. You ever find yourself in a situation that something scares you so bad that you just react without thinking about it? 
I found myself in a similar situation like that a few weeks ago. I was uh, walking, I went for a morning walk, a neighborhood right across the street from our, our neighborhood, and I was, had been walking about 30 minutes, and it's about three blocks away from the home, and all of a sudden I heard a dog barking. When I turned to my left, this dog was right here. He was coming at me, he didn't want to play. He was just running and barking and charging at me, he was a big dog. Before I knew it, I didn't even think, I was on top of a parked car. Not on the trunk, on the roof of the parked car. So I'm on top of the parked the park car, just like, oh Lord, what is this dog? I'm going to climb up the car, and I'm just like not even seeing where the dog is. All of a sudden, the owner of the dog said, I'm so sorry, he can't get out the yard, it's an invisible fence. <laughs> With invisible. This is invisible to me too. Because all I saw was the dog. But before I knew it, I was on top of this car. She was like, I'm so sorry, but he ain't gonna hurt you. I'm like, oh, my heart racing. So I climbed down off the car, and right about that moment, the owner of the car came out the house. <laughs> so, the older lady walked out, she said, were you just on top of my car? I said, ma'am, I am so sorry. The dog was chasing me, I was so scared. Baby, the dog can't get out the yard. I said, I'm so sorry, I didn't know. I felt so bad. She was like, my son bought me this car. I was like, this lady gonna shoot me or what? She had, I love Jesus, t shirt on. So I knew it was gonna be a okay. So I felt so bad, y'all. I, I gave her my number, I said, if there's anything wrong with your car, please call. Look, I felt so bad. I came back 10 minutes later and gave her $20. Will you let me wash your car for <laughs> Emotional response to uh, uh, awareness of danger, right? I didn't have to think about it. I just thought, I just, Lord, just made it get out of the way, right? So I don't believe God is telling us to not fear physical danger, right? He gives us common sense. He gives us instinct. And, and those instincts are designed to keep us safe. God also says that he gives his angels charge over us. Psalms 91, 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in thy hands, lest they dash 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 their feet against a stone. So thank God he gives us an instinct to know when you're watching the dog, even when the dog can't get you. So what about fear of the Lord? All right, that's the second definition. Now, Proverbs 1, 7 says, fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Right so you can't do anything in this world. You, you can't understand anything unless you understand the fear of God first. Amen. Right? The fear of the Lord is one of deep reverence. When we recognize how awesome the power of God is, it creates a holy fear in us to worship God and to obey his word. Now, God displayed this, his, this type of power to the children of Israel in the wilderness when he gave them the Ten Commandments. God spoke to the people, and the power of his voice was so awesome that they couldn't bear it. Exodus 20, verses 18 through 19 says, When the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance, trembling with fear. And they said to Moses, you speak to us, and we will listen. But don't let God speak directly to us, or we will die. That's how powerful. See, they, they got a chance to witness the miracles of God face to face. So they had fear, because they saw what God was doing. But sometimes we forget how awesome God is. He is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Before him, there was nothing in there will be no after him because he's eternal. He is Yahweh, the Lord and creator of all things. Everything that exists was made by him and through him. Nothing can and ever will exist unless God creates it. He is El Shaddai, the most high God. No one or nothing is higher than him, bigger than him, stronger than him, wiser than him, more powerful than him. God is out of reach, yet he's everywhere at the same time. He knows everything hears every prayer, knows every heart, and still finds time to rule the universe. Our God is awesome. And we should fear him. God is awesome. We should fear him. We need to recognize he's God. Nothing is higher than him. So obviously God has been telling us not to fear him. Right? right? So what's left? What fear should we avoid? Philippians 
chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. In that New Living Translation, it says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for what He has done. The King James Version says, Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. An attitude of worry is the type of fear God wants us to avoid. Our attitudes are choices, y'all, based on what we believe. Our attitude is a choice based on what we believe. When we have an attitude of worry, we choose to believe that something bad is going to happen to us, and we question God's goodness towards us in that particular situation. For every worry that we have, there's an underlying fear. Every worry has a fear. If you're worried about money, you're questioning God's ability to provide for you. If you're worried about being sick, you're questioning God's ability to heal you. If you're worried about relationships, you're questioning God's ability to give you peace and happiness. When we worry about these things, we're really saying that we don't believe God is really in control. And he really doesn't love us. Ultimately, we're doubting God's word. His word says he will never leave you or forsake you. His word says that he so loved the world that he gave his only son. And whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe that, church? It's a choice. We can choose to believe that. So how do we defeat fear? God told us not to have that, that spirit of fear. How do we defeat it? Well, first of all, we need to recognize that it's a spirit. That's it. Right? Because fear is just not a feeling. Spirit of fear is a spirit. That's right. It says not to have a, not giving us a spirit of fear. Y'all remember the story of Job? How God allowed Satan to launch an attack on him? Yeah. It was actually Job's fear that opened the door to that attack. Y'all don't know the story? Job was a very wealthy man. The, the, the word God said that he was an upright man. He feared the Lord and did good. He owned more than any, any other person in, in the land at that time. He had a lot of children. They were very, very blessed. Job, but God allowed Satan to attack all of his possessions and his body and his children. And when, all, when that attack was launched, Job said in chapter 3, verse 25, For the thing that I greatly fear has come upon me, and what I dread has happened. Satan uses fear as a weapon to expose the weakness of your faith. He uses those fears to accuse us in front of God. So whatever it is that we are fearful about, and we articulate that fear with our mouth, Satan hears it and then goes back in front of God and says, yeah, see Preston, you don't really believe that you're going to help him. He's scared. He's, he got fear in this part. It's like he don't really believe that you're going to help him. So guess what happens then? The Lord has to Test and see if he's right. Right? All right. Try it. The, the thing that we should remember about God, though, if he's, if he's telling us that fear is not from him, he's going to give us an alternative. One thing I love about God is if he, if he tells us that a particular spirit is not from him, he's going to tell us what kind of spirit is from him. Right? He's not going to make us figure that out on our own. When God tells us something is bad, he always points us to something else that's good. God wants us to know him. And he wants us to be like him. And by giving us that understanding, that's how we recognize who God is. And that's how we live more like him. Here's an example of, of when God tells us what's wrong, but then tells us what's right as an alternative. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 23, it says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambi uh, ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
self-control. Against such there is no law. Whenever we see the word but in scripture, you guys are studying the word, you see the word but, you should get ready to shout. When you see but, because that means God is going to tell you what his alternative is. His better alternative is. Amen. God, God's alternative to fear is power, love, and a sound life. Let's read that scripture again. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, but of love, and a sound mind. The gift God gives believers is the Holy Spirit. Alright, the Holy Spirit is that gift. And the Holy Spirit, the attributes of the Holy Spirit is his power, is his love, and is his mind. That's all what the Holy Spirit does for us. So let's take a look at each one of those. Love, his, his power, his love, and the sound mind. So how do we tap into God's power? Praising God unleashes the power of the Holy Spirit into your situation. Now, Sundays when, when Pastor asks me to pray, I often quote a scripture. I say, Lord, you inhabit the praises of your people. Now, that scripture is actually Psalm 22, 3. It says, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabit the praises of Israel. The New King James Version says, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. The New Living Translation says, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. That on the praises of Israel, that's where we get to saying, lift him up. When we lift him up in praise, we're actually putting, we're actually holding Christ up in our situation. When we pray, we bring him into our situation. And we enthrone him on our praise, which means we magnify him bigger than that thing that's giving us fear. Y'all remember the story of King Saul and David? Yes, sir. Where God sent a tormenting spirit on Saul. And the only way that that spirit would leave Saul is when David would come in his presence and play the heart. Yes. And that tormenting spirit would leave. Yes. You guys need to do that same thing. When that tormenting spirit comes upon you, I don't care if you can't see, hold a note. You need to find whatever that praise song is to uplift your spirit. Put that thing on your iPod, your AirPod. And walk around your own house and raise up your hands to the Lord and say, I will sing the praise of the Lord. You can put your hands to I'm going to sing to you right now, Lord, because I want you to be magnified in this day. Praise stirs up the spirit and it puts the enemy to flight. That's why it's so important that we adopt an environment of praise here in our church. That's why we praise here before we do anything else. And when, when, the, when the young ladies praise here, they're not just putting on the show. They're ushering us. They're inviting us to praise with them. We need to open our own mouth and give them our own praise. We need to wake our own people. So the next spirit comes in here, and anybody that walks in here with a tormented spirit is going to be made to go with our hands. We need to lift them up in this place. There's another reason God gives us his power. Now, he gives us his power when we live for him and we proclaim Christ. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witness, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Our Lord promises the Holy Spirit. He will give us the Holy Spirit's power, but only to do His will. Yeah. If you're trying to find why, why you don't have power right now, are you doing God's will? God's not going to give you power when you're living a life that's not the life He would proclaim for you to have. We got to do God's will. We got to understand what God wants from us. We got to be obedient to God. Then we get the power. He's not going to give this person's Holy Spirit for you to do what you want to do. It's got to be what God wants to do. Yeah. 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 If you are not glorifying God through the way you are living your life, you're not going to receive this power. That's it. That's it. 
The second alternative to fear that God gives us is love. First John chapter 4 verses 15 through 18 says, All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them. And they live in God. We know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love. God is love. And all who live in love live in God. And God lives in them. And we live in God. As we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. But we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in the world. Such love has no fear. Because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Here's the message, y'all. If we are saved, and we believe Christ died for us, and we believe that if we drop dead right now, that we're going to be in glory right now, in the presence of the, of the Most High God, if we believe that, we have nothing to fear here on earth. Why, why are we fearing anything if we believe we're going to happen? Think about a minute. Think about that one thing that you're fearful about. Whatever it is. It could be your health. God don't heal me or not. It could be, you know, your financial situation. It could be something with your children. I got that testimony. Because God don't fix the situation. But what's hard? Is it harder for God to save us from eternal damnation and send us to heaven or to fix that situation? I think it's a lot easier for us for him to fix that situation. But if we believe upon our salvation, then we know it's already fixed. The areas that we don't believe is those areas we haven't given to God completely. That's what we have fear about. The word also says that we have fear because fear of punishment. That means there's some area in our life we aren't living right, and we feel a little sense of guilt about it. We know that part of our life is not what God is calling us to do. So we feel like our prayers are not reaching out of the room because we feel like, man, yeah, Lord, I want you to move, but I can't leave this thing alone that I've been doing. I can't leave this relationship alone that I've been living in. I can't leave this, this substance alone that I'm tied to. I can't leave this, this habit I got, these things I look at, these things I do. I, I got these things that sway me away from God's goodness. And because I know I, have, I got a fear of punishment, a fear of punishment about these things. So I'm scared that God's not going to answer those prayers. The last thing the Holy Spirit gives us is a sound mind. Throughout the Bible, the Holy Spirit is personified as wisdom, right? If you read Proverbs, it speaks about wisdom as if it's an actual person. Wisdom does this. Wisdom does that, right? Wisdom is the Holy Spirit. When, when uh, King uh, Solomon prayed to God, he said, well, give me wisdom so that I can govern your people as to your will. What God really did was send his Holy Spirit on him. The Holy Spirit made him the wisest man that ever lived. A sound mind also means self-control and the ability to control one's emotions, feelings, and thoughts in the midst of trials, no matter how severe or stressful. The Holy Spirit gives us that peace that surpasses all understanding. With the Holy Spirit, we can control our thoughts so that we aren't overwhelmed by fear. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 through 6 says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So I didn't understand that scripture until somebody explained it to me one time. I was at a men's conference down in Atlanta, Georgia, and they had a, a speaker who was an ex-Navy SEAL. So here's somebody who knew about battle, right? And he, he was teaching about this scripture. We were talking about how our thought life and things we think about paralyze us and take us away from God. 
And he said, this scripture where it says, capture every thought and make it obey the word of Christ. He said, you can interpret that as put a spear to the throat of it. So if you got a thought that's a, a thought that's not from God, imagine grabbing that thought by the throat and putting a spear to it. Like, thought, this thought is not one I'm going to have right now. What does the word of God say about this situation? The word of God says that I'm, I am more than a conqueror, so I'm not going to worry about this thing, right? Yeah. That's what the Holy Spirit allows us to have that sound mind so that we can recognize our thought life, the things that we think about that lead us away from God. Y'all, the real reason that we can live without fear is because we are children of God. If you give your life to Christ, then you are now a child of God. And fear is no longer your battle. Romans 8, 15 said, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Well, Instead, you receive God's spirit yeah. when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. Y'all know we can run to our Father? We can run to our Heavenly Father like we run to our Earthly Father when we are afraid. He knows what we are afraid of. of. He knows the fears that we have. He, he created us before we were even thought of. So he knows what's in us. We just have to trust him, y'all. So I want to leave y'all with a serious question. Are you confident about your salvation? If you are confident about your salvation and you know that you, uh, you've given your life to Christ and you can live with your life without fear if you're confident of your salvation, we begin to doubt in those areas where we have not fully given those areas to God. So here's my challenge. Whatever area in your life that you're experiencing fear, fully give that thing to God. Whatever it is. Just give that thing to God. If there is some sin in your life that's making you question God's grace, deal with it. Go a different way. Let it go. If there's something making you feel like you're going to be punished by God, God doesn't want to punish you. But he will. God, God is, 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 is a good dad. But good daddies chasing their children. They don't just turn their head and that's what you're doing wrong. Let it go. If you're not sure about your salvation, then you have a different challenge. There's a different challenge I have for you. Everything in your life will be consumed by fear because you're trying to operate in your own power. If you haven't confessed your sins, you haven't given your life to Christ, Fear is what you have to look forward to. Because you'll never be able to overcome the fears of this world on your own power. So you, you need to make that decision today. If you want to get out of fear, make that decision right now. You aren't tapping into God's love. You aren't tapping into his power. You aren't receiving God's wisdom because you aren't you haven't joined his team. So where are you? Are you ready to choose faith over fear? It's a constant thing. I want to choose faith over fear every day. Amen. Every day. Before I go to my seat, I want to leave y'all. There's a, there's a song, and I'm not going to sing it. Sing it, sing it. There's a song called No Longer a Slave to Fear. Right? It's for a group called Bethel Music. I used to play in a worship band down in Georgia, and I was a drummer, and we played this song. And the, the words, I think, just remind us of who we are and how we don't need to fear. And it goes, you unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies. Till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave of fear. I'm a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I am no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. I am surrounded by the arms of the Father. I am surrounded by songs of deliverance. We've been liberated from our bondage. We're your sons and daughters. Let us sing our freedom. You split the sea so I can walk right through. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I can stand and say, I am a child of God. Yes, I am a child of God. God bless y'all.
here for the power and of love and of a sound mind. And y'all, that's what it's about. Somebody's watching us today on live stream, and God has told me through the message that you don't have to fear. And sometimes we do, and it's because we don't have that relationship that we should have with God. But just like he said, he's not giving you that spirit. No, not that spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. With our head bowed, Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. We thank you for the message and the messenger. Lord, we thank you for each soul that is here today. Lord, we don't know what everybody deals with or what everybody goes through. But Lord, just let them know whatever it is, if they call on the name of God, he will hear and he will bless. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We want to remind everyone that's watching us on live stream that uh, on Tuesday nights we'll have our uh, prayer call at 7 o'clock and then again on Friday morning at 6 a.m. and then back here again at 11 o'clock on next Sunday morning and also just again to remind everyone that we will be celebrating our 30th year church anniversary this afternoon at 4 p.m. Amen, amen. And we're asking everybody to come back this evening. But more than that, those that are watching us on live stream, we will be live streaming the service this afternoon. Amen. amen. So those that are watching on live stream, have a great day.